Hello. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. Okay. I'm only going to talk for about 40 minutes because I know you're here for, I'm kidding, because I know you're here for other people. Um, but I'm Frank. I'm the librarian here at the Jefferson Market Library. Uh, no applause. Okay, fine. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my God. Now I completely forgot what I was to say. All right, I have to say certain things. Welcome to the library for Notes from the Reading Life, which is co-partnered by the New York Department of Cultural Affairs and the National Book Foundation. I hit my nose. Uh, welcome. So what else do I have to say? Notes from the Reading Life, that's what you're here for. I'm not going to say who's going to be on the stage because you already know, but and someone else will introduce them. But. I wanted to say one thing that I read a quote the other day, which was convenient because I knew I had to say some words today. And that quote was li about libraries. There's a new book called The Library. And it, it said, libraries are human spaces filled with stories. Right, we, we know that. I mean, certainly those of us that work in the library know that because like just today, was crazy and there was a hugely diverse amount of people that came through the doors today and it's always exciting and it's always interesting and it is a very human place and obviously all these books around you are telling stories that are mysteries to us if you haven't read the book. Um, but one story I want to tell you very quickly is that if you don't know this library was once a courthouse. It was built as a courthouse in 1877. And over 50 years ago, it was going to be demolished because modernist architecture was the way to go and this was considered a crazy monstrosity and they were going to knock it down. But the community rallied to save it. And this is before landmarks. This is before any preservation existed. This is the 60s. And the public, the community, saved the library and asked that it be a public space, a library. So I just wanted to tell you the story of these, this, these names and letters and handwriting you see above you. This was for the 50th anniversary of this building as a library and all of these, this handwriting is letters written to us over 50 years, children's signatures as they got their very first library cards from 67 all the way to now. And I felt, and we felt here at the library that the only thing that could go on these walls that would sort of be bigger than or as important a, as the architecture is the community and the people's voices that save the library and continue to use it to today. So I hope you take a look. If you get bored, what's going on up here? You can just like read the wall. Sorry, Tim and Min. <laughs> oh, Lisa's <laughs> shaking her head. Anyway, I'm gonna shut up. So thank you for coming and I would like, to, oh, mention, I hope you got a copy of Simon Winchester's The Professor and the Mad Men book about writing, the writing of the Oxford English Dictionary. In a couple of months, we'd like to do a program here. If you want to give me feedback, I'd love to. I would love to do a program based on people's favorite words. Like do an installation somewhere else in the library about what your favorite word is using the Oxford English Dictionary and have a ballot box or something like that. I'm working on it. I know I should have had it down by today. That was my deadline, but I didn't do it and I'm sorry, but we'll think about it. If you have any ideas, let me know. So now, please. Did I forget anything? Let me introduce the executive director of the National Book Foundation, Lisa Lucas. All right. Thank you, Frank. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Hold on, I think I messed up the mic. That's what I do. Well, I'll just hold it. All right, there we go, that's easier. Um, I'm really excited to be here because when I first moved back to New York, uh, this was the branch that I came to, and so I look at all the walls and all the books, and I think about coming here and checking books out after I'd gone to like three lives and seen all the books that I could not afford to buy, and then came here and borrowed them. Uh, so it's really cool to be here in one of the branches. Um, and we're really excited uh, to be here for Notes from the Reading Life. Uh, this is a project that is two years in the making. Um, it started with discussions about how the National Book Foundation might work with the New York Public Library. And one of the things that we really wanted to do was take marquee events, take people that you were so excited to see and actually bring them to the branches, bring them to the Bronx, bring them to Staten Island, and not just do stuff at the big theater on 42nd Street. Um, and to buy books and to think about how we could bring together not only writers that you're excited about reading their books, but also to try and introduce people to reading 
by taking people that you don't know best from their writing or from their reading lives and helping them to share with you all of the joy that they take from the books that they have in their nightstands and in their lives. Um, Last week, we kicked off our program in Harlem with the Studio Museum's Thelma Golden and author Caitlin Greenwich. And tonight, we are honored and delighted that two of my favorite people, I've spent many, 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 many hours reading men's writing and watching Project Runway. Um, Tim Gunn is here tonight to continue the series, and Min Jin Lee will facilitate the conversation. Um, so I'm going to introduce Min in a moment, and she's going to introduce Tim, and they're going to have a conversation that's going to take about 40 minutes, and then you will have a chance to ask questions. This is going to be uh, videotaped and podcasted, so if you have a question at the end, raise your hand, we will bring you a mic, and that way it will be recorded for posterity. Um, in a week, the series is going to travel to the Bronx Library Branch in going to feature comedian Desus Nice and WNYC's Rebecca Carroll on June 15th. And then on June 29th, TBD who it will be, but it will be very exciting, will be at the Richmond Town Branch Library on Staten Island. Um, and I'm sorry I'm talking so much, but before we get started, I do want to tell you a little bit about the National Book Foundation. Um, we are best known for the National Book Awards. How many of you have heard of the National Book Awards? Okay, that is good. That makes me happy. I've been in rooms sometimes where I'm like, have you heard of the National Book Awards? And everybody's like, and I'm like, it's kind of self-explanatory. <laughs> um, but our mission is to celebrate the best literature in America, expand its audience, and ensure that books have a prominent place in American culture. Um, one way that we do that is through the National Book Awards. And since 1950, we have celebrated great books with honorees including William Carlos Williams, Flannery O'Connor, Ralph Ellison, Rachel Carson, Colson Whitehead, ta Coates, John Lewis, the legend who cried when he got his National Book Award. Uh, Jasmine Ward, Lydia Davis, John Edgar Wideman, goes on and on. But our work is not just about the National Book Awards. It's also about bringing people into literature, about connecting reader and book. And the way that we do that is through a series of public and educational programs. A couple things that we have done recently that we're really proud of is a partnership called the Book Rich Environments Initiative, which works with HUD and the um, Department of Education and with the National Center for Families Learning. And we just shipped out 422,000 books to public housing authorities across the country. Um, which is exciting. Um, we're about to kick off on, for us, unprecedented um, public programming push where we'll be doing things like the Art for Justice um, Fund gave us money to do literature for justice. So we'll be using books to try and change hearts and minds, try to let people know what mass incarceration in America really looks like. We'll be going to colleges and universities and performing art centers and libraries all across the country and trying to bring authors to audiences and to readers, whether they are already a reader or they will be a reader. Um, over the next year. Um, so we do all sorts of work. But tonight, uh, we are grateful to the New York Public Library for this new partnership. Um, and I'd like to especially thank Faye Rosenfeld, Emily Krell, Alex Kelly, and Raylan Rogan for partnering us. And two years in the making, but about three months in the, the putting it together. So it was a really big push. Um, also, a huge thanks to the National Book Foundation staff, especially Whitney Hu, Hu and Beth Harrison. Um, and then to the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs for making this literally possible. And now, I'm done talking, I'm just gonna introduce Min. I'm delighted to introduce Min Jin Lee. Min's Pachinko was a finalist for the National Book Award for Fiction, a New York Times 10 Best Books of 2017, a US Today Top 10 Books of 2017, a library, an American Library Association notable book, and an American Booksellers Association Indie Next Great Reads. It's a New York Times bestseller. Pachinko was also a top 10 book of the year for the BBC, Canadian Broadcasting Company, San Francisco Chronicle, dang, man. The New York Public Library, Seattle Post Intelligencer, and the Chicago Public Library. It was on over 75 best book of the year lists. Her debut novel, Free Food for Millionaires, was a top 10 book of the year for the Times of London, NPR's Fresh Air, and US Today. She's also a recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship for Fiction and has received the NYFA Fellowship for Fiction. She's clearly a chump <laughs> and has not been working hard at all. I'd like to introduce Min and welcome to the stage. Thank you.
Good evening. Can you hear me? We're good? So thank you, Frank. Frank, where are you? Thank you for having us. And thank you, Lisa, for the introduction. Most people think that Lisa is a supermodel, but that's not true. She's actually just a literary superhero. So thank you for carrying the torch for literature, for not just this award thing, but actually she cares so deeply about social justice and, and making sure that all people have access to literature, especially to children. So thank you, Lisa. I also want to thank Beth and Whitney because they did all this heavy lifting. The folks at the library, um, very close to my heart, I grew up in the library. And I was thinking about the sound of music today. You know that song when Maria and Georg are singing to each other? I must have done something good. <laughs> I feel like we must have done something really good because we get to hang out with Tim Gunn tonight. <laughs> So Tim Gunn is an Emmy Award winning co-host of a seminal reality TV show which you may have heard of called Project Runway, which is entering its 17th season on Lifetime. I just should add right here that Tim was not paid for the first two seasons and he's going to explain why. <laughs> he is a New York Times bestselling author, and his fourth book, The Natty Professor, was released in 2015, and it chronicles his 29 years as an educator and 10 years as a mentor on Project Runway. Tim has spent 24 years as a teacher and as an administrator at the Parsons School of Design, and the last seven of which serving as a chair of the Department of Fashion Design. Just in terms of housekeeping, if we could take our cell phones and put it on airplane mode. As much as I like the ring of truth. And secondly, I think that um, we're gonna just chat about Tim's five favorite books. And if we, you could help me welcome the great Tim Gunn. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I just want to begin by saying I'm never happier than when I'm in a library or a bookstore. It's a wonderful, comforting feeling. You know, everybody thinks that Tim's this fashion arbiter, but actually he's just like a really good-looking nerd. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, I know. Can I also say in your presence, <laughs> sitting here with Min Jin Lee, considering your achievements in writing and my own, I feel like a mongrel at the Westminster Kennel Club. <laughs> What can you say to that? <laughs> <laughs> so when I was asked to do this event, I got really excited. I got so excited that I did something incredibly rude. I was committed to do another event in Denver where I had to teach for five days in a row, and I contacted them and I said, is it possible to compress five days of teaching in four days? Because I want to talk to Tim Gunn. That's why you did it. Yeah. I didn't, re thank you, I didn't realize that. But I thought you were just trying to have, spend less time in Denver. No. No, Denver's perfectly nice. <laughs> no, I really wanted to be here, so I just wanted to prove that I really wanted to be here today, so that's what I did. And all my students were said, please give our love to Tim. Aww. And they were willing to start class at 8.15 so that I could be here, so there's a whole world out there <laughs> devoted to you. <laughs> or angry. No. So, when um, Lisa asked us to be here today, I was able to see Tim's favorite books, and there are 14 incredible books, and then I was absolutely positive what a nerd you are. I but am. With such good taste, he has such amazing taste in literature. So from the 14 books, because we can't talk about all of them today, we chose five. And we're going to talk about it in a certain kind of order, because I thought that you should know the transit of a really great person's mind and how he forms according to his books. So the first book that we have 
on the roster is by an author named Sylvia Plath. And I thought with each author, I would give you a teeny tiny bit of his, her biography, and then we'll talk about the book that Tim chose because Sylvia Plath is known primarily as a poet. She was born in 1932, and then she died, as you know, in 1963 at the age of 31 by suicide, which is, I think, in all of our minds lately, very sadly. Her mother was a second generation Austrian, and her father was a German immigrant and a professor of entomology. So, and he studied bumblebees. Uh, her father died when she was eight, and she got her BA from Smith. She's a confessional poet, married to Ted Hughes, not the best husband in the world, and she suffered from se severe depression. Um, Tim chose The Bell Jar, a semi-autobiographical novel posthumously published by her husband, Ted Hughes, when he needed to buy a beach house. Did you know that? No. Yeah. Shameful. Shameful. It is, it is actually really shameful because they already, he already had two homes, but he wanted to buy a country, sea, like a seaside resort. For I had no idea. So he contacted Sylvia's mom saying, is it okay if I publish this book in the U.S. because the American publishers never wanted it. It was already published in the, in the U.K., but it didn't get very good reviews. But then he thought he would capitalize on the fact that she's getting all this attention for Ariel. And the mom said, no way, Jose. Just like that. <laughs> <laughs> she said it more politely. But then he did it anyway. I had no idea. I've never heard this story before. Yeah. Fascinating and horrifying what we in a way, about. except that we now know the book well, and right. if not intimately, and it was certainly important for me. I'm glad it was published, but it was interesting because the mom was really against it. But they think it's because she wanted to protect her kind of avatar role in it. I thought I would read you a little tiny bit of this very famous quote that some of you may be familiar with. Called, it's the fig tree section. Okay. I saw my life branching out before me like the green fig tree in the story. From the tip of every branch like a fat purple fig, a wonderful future beckoned and winked. One fig was a husband and a happy home and children. Another fig was a famous poet and another fig was a brilliant professor. And another fig was E.G., an amazing editor. And another fig was Europe and Africa and South America. And another fig was Constantine and Socrates and Attila. I saw myself sitting in the crotch of the fig tree, starving to death, just because I couldn't make up my mind which of the figs I would choose. I wanted each and every one of them, but choosing one meant losing all the rest. And as I sat there, unable to decide, the figs began to wrinkle and go black, and one by one, they plopped to the ground at my feet. Tell us about your fig tree. My fig tree. At any particular time, as a, as a child? Especially as as a, in, in your development as a young thinker. Because uh, the other thing that Tim and I have in common is we both went to a fancy college in Connecticut, and we didn't like it. Yes, we, I'm, I'm so happy to hear that. Yeah. And, and, and it rhymes with jail. <laughs> and it was. So at that moment in time, do you feel like there was a kind of fig tree for you or certain figs where you felt like you wanted to pluck them but you couldn't? Well, I had a very, well, I'm not implying that we all didn't, but I had a very complex childhood and adolescence and, and it wasn't exactly a happy one. And I was desperately seeking who I am, who is that person. Um, and for me, that fig tree and the, the, the figs on that tree would have, I think, also been fairly shriveled because I originally went to school to be an architect. That didn't work out. Then I opted for literature, um, more because it was books were so joyous for me and, and such a salvation and an escape. Um, and I had toyed with the idea of being a writer, but I didn't really have the passion, and I thought it will never happen for me. Um, so looking at the fig tree, I, I wanted I would have wanted um, some escape. 
I, I don't think I would have even cared about an escape to what. And I would have wanted, an, not happiness, but an antidote to unhappiness. I think to ask for happiness is hubris in a way. Um, we should be very pleased with contentment. Um, but I didn't want to be totally unhappy. I totally agree with that. I totally agree with this thing with happiness. I'm actually quite famous for knowing that I don't believe in the pursuit of happiness. I believe in the pursuit of goodness. Goodness, yes. I think that's totally achievable. I think the pursuit of happiness is preposterous. I think it's making all of us miserable. And, and also, how do we define it? And it right. can be so different for each of us. And you and I seem so joyous anyway. Yeah. Don't we? <laughs> I love life. It's a great, ad it's serendipitous adventure. Yes. Um, the second book we're going to kind of s slightly move into because there are five books that we really want to cover. And the second part is as we have this idea of illness and health and desire. And it's Tim, a, definitely a theme among those that have been chosen, yes. Absolutely. So Tim chose uh, uh, Thomas Mann, a German author who was born from 1875 to 1955. He was from a bourgeoisie family. He married in 1905 to Katya Pringshin, who was born in a secular Jewish family. And he, she converted to Lutheranism. And this becomes relevant because later on, Thomas Mann famously resists the Nazis and he has to keep moving around because he has essentially Jewish children. And he comes to the United States and he becomes an American citizen. And then he has to leave because of McCarthyism, which I think is so interesting because we have our own form of um, vicious thought. And the book and, that- And again, sorry, I won't <laughs> politicize this. But we all know. I think we all probably agree, too, yeah. yeah. So in the, book, the book that you chose is The Magic Mountain by Thomas Mann, in, which was published in 1924. He worked on it for about 12 years, and it's widely considered his Bildungsroman, and was inspired by his wife's stay at a sanatorium in Davos in Switzerland when his wife was uh, ill. Can you talk to me about why, the, why a young person in New York City should read that book? The Magic Mountain is a transformational journey, at least it was for me. Um, it is a beautiful, stimulating narrative about a, a, a haunting experience. Um, the main character in the book spends seven years in a sanitarium with tuberculosis, and he arrives at the sanitarium thinking he's perfectly healthy. He's visiting uh, a cousin, his cousin. Um, and then he's diagnosed, and it's about the struggle with illness, about uh, the possibility that he will never recover, about the possibility that he will never see a world outside of the sanitarium, and about all of the corresponding emotions and anxieties, which are certainly emotions, but it, it's a very moving tale, lots of allegorical elements um, pertaining to the, to the modern world at that time. Um, and I just, I found it beautiful. I will say this though, I struggled with the first 60 pages and then I was completely hooked. But that happens to me a lot. It happens to me, to me with people too. Um, <laughs> the first 60 minutes may be a little trying and then you think, this is the person I've been waiting my entire life to meet. And that's how I felt about the Magic Mountain. The exact same way, and, and I should add too about this theme of illness, just to give full disclosure and transparency because I like to be transparent. Um, these books became very dear to me after I struggled with my own um, mental health issues and a very serious suicide attempt and I was institutionalized for two years and three months, which as a teenager is a long time, it's a long time anyway. but. So these books spoke to me. Um, the Bell Jar, The Magic Mountain, um, a, a, a segment from You Can't Go Home Again, uh, uh, Simon Winchester's the, the Professor and the Mad, Mad Man. Um, these are books that had a potency for me and a relevance, um, and, and I felt these are authors who understand me, and it, it, in a very intimate, very, very personal way. So that's part of the underlying current, just again, in the spirit of full transparency. And 
I think that we writers really do understand this idea of being sort of being in this cage. And when we read narratives in which people are institutionalized and cannot leave these institutions and cages, we feel like we need to understand how do you get out? Yes. Right? Is it possible to get out? And I think these works really speak to us intimately and they are a consolation when we feel so troubled. I will also say though, in, in, in probably all of the books in a manner of speaking, since I had such an intense experience for so long, hearing the voice of someone going through that and hearing the degree, the degree of resolve or um, resignation was also very comforting because then the big surprise package is you're out. Um, and, and you may think that that would never happen. And I think sometimes what I really get irritated about with modern society in this quest for this constant, if you make your bed, you'll be happy. I'm literally making fun of a book right now. Actually, I, I do believe that. <laughs> It's the first thing I do in the morning. <laughs> I think it can make you feel a little bit more organized with the chaos, but I don't think it could solve all the problems. And sometimes like, I feel like it's, we're insensitive to people who really suffer because yeah. we throw these books at them. And I guess I was trying to figure out, when did you feel like you were going to come out of it? When, when I went to art school, it was, it was an entire awakening for me. For the first time in my life, the answer wasn't in the, in the back of the book. And with 25-ish students in the room, there were 25 different solutions to every, um, every assignment that was presented. And it was, I felt unshackled. Um, even when I was uh, studying literature, I felt so boxed in. Um, and I felt so, just so confined to only a certain area of literature and, and unable to grasp things that I, that I may have wanted to. And in art school, it was, I mean, it was a bit of a shock to be unshackled when you're so used to being tied and tethered. Uh, but it was the most joyous, uh, I, I, I felt as though I was soaring through the clouds. It was just the most wonderful feeling. And it's also what propelled me to want to teach, because I thought I want to be the kind of teacher who, who nurtures this creative spirit, this desire to do your best, and, and also to watch students, and, and, and in my case, I, I was projecting, watch individuals have an epiphany about who they can be. It was the most remarkable thing. And I have to say, too, just briefly about the experience, I went to art school wanting to be a painter, um, and it's all that I wanted to be. And I was forced, literally, to take a three-dimensional design class. No, 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 I'm not interested, I want to stay with the two dimensions. No, you're going to take a three-dimensional design class. No, I'm not. I even threatened to leave school. And it, it was through being forced to have that experience that I realized I love working in three dimensions, and I became a sculptor. But so it, it's also, it's, it's not that I was coddled and, and cajoled and people just patted me on the head and said, do whatever you want. It was really the toughest work I've ever had to experience as a student. But you're also being pushed to do something that you felt like you could do and that you wanted to do. Because I think one of the things that's really problematic about college these days is that even now you still have to do all these things you don't want to do. Well, in some cases, in other cases, you write your own curriculum, which I think is a huge error. <laughs> Sorry, I'll editorialize. So if you could, when you were at Parsons, did you find that you had to kind of direct your students to take things they didn't want to? Oh, all the time, and I loved it. <laughs> I loved it because I knew in most cases they were going to have this aha moment, this moment of discovery where they, they would say to themselves, this is who I really want to be. If I hadn't had this experience, this would never have happened. No, I loved it. I mean, I, I would say to them, especially when I took over the fashion program, because the curriculum that was created, and I didn't do this alone, it was a, a big collaboration with the faculty, and I will say with the students too, um, I said to, to the students, 
this is a plate of food. You have to eat everything on your plate. It is not a buffet. If you say to yourself, I've had way too many peas, I don't want any more peas, I don't care, you're eating these peas. <laughs> so, I'm a, I'm a disciplinarian, I do it with tough love. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna eat my peas. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> If they're on the plate. Right, absolutely. There, the third book that I wanted to touch on, which is so cool, is that as we have this sort of sadness and malaise and a sense of self-doubt, and then we go to try to figure out what does death mean and what does life mean in Thomas Mann, the next book is Cleopatra by oh. Stacey Schiff. An absolutely right anachronistic icon, right? And so Stacy Schiff, very living, very vital, born in October 26, 1961. She's only 56, which is like a child, right? She was an editor at Simon & Schuster, and then she's also a critic at probably the best um, places in the world. She's highly lauded, and we won't get into too much, but right now, in terms of Cleopatra, this book is so amazing because it's a vivid and clear biography of a brilliant leader who's been misremembered and mischaracterized by popular culture and by her own success. And she's a product of incest, which you probably guys know, and she married two of her brothers, one of whom ends up getting hacked. And then- And it was common, it wasn't unusual. Right, routinely you marry your brother and kill him. And then- <laughs> <laughs> Well, if you wanna stay in charge, yes, you yes. do. Yes, no, no, no I, I, sure, I would do it. Um, and then- <laughs> She was the lover, of course, of Julius Caesar and Mark Antony. She was a polyglot, she was wealthy, she was powerful, and she was a brilliant tactician. And there's a really cool section, which I thought it might be fun for you to hear Tim read. It's very short, it's very beautiful. And it, su it sums the book up beautifully, one second. She elicited scorn and envy in equal and equally distorting measure. Her story is constructed as much of male fear as fantasy. From Plutarch descends history's greatest love story. Though Cleopatra's life was neither as lurid nor as romantic as, as has been made out. And she became a femme fatale twice over. For Actium to, to be the battle to beat all battles, she had to be the wild queen plotting Rome's destruction. For Antony to have succumbed to something other than a fellow Roman, Cleopatra had to be a disarming sedu seductress who had already ruined him and would make his ruin still more complete. It can be difficult to say where vengeance ends and homage begins. Her, her power was immediately enhanced because for one man's historical purposes, she needed to have, she needed to have reduced another to abject slavery. It was true that she was a dutiful father-loving daughter, a patriot and protector, an early nationalist, a symbol of courage, a wise ruler with nerves of steel, a master at self-presentation. It is not true that she built the lighthouse of Alexandria, could manufacture gold, was the ideal woman, a martyr to love, a silly little girl, the mother of Christ, a seventh century Coptic bishop termed termed her the most illustrious and wise of women, greater than the kings who preceded her. On a good day, Cleopatra is said to have died for love, which is not exactly true either. Ultimately, everyone from Michelangelo and we'll go on to Bertolt Brecht got a crack at her. The Renaissance was obsessed with her, the Romantics yet more so. She sent even Shakespeare over the top, eliciting from him his greatest female role, his richest poetry, a full Antony-less last act, and in the estimation of one critic, a rollicking tribute to guilt-free, middle-aged adultery. Shakespeare may, be, Shakespeare may be as much to blame for our having lost sight of Cleopatra IV as the Alexandrian humidity, Roman propaganda, and Elizabeth Taylor's limpid lilac eyes. That's Stacey Schiff, though. She's she's good. Wonderful. She's really good. And I have to say, too, I am obsessed with ancient history, and I've read a number of biographies of Cleopatra. This is the first one written by a woman, and I think it's it's why it's so brilliant. Uh, women understand women. Now, what did you find personally drawing? Um, why did, why were you drawn to Cleopatra? 
Well, she is a kind of lynch, linchpin in ancient history, and there are, there are so many myths that surround her. And I had read reviews of the book, so I was attracted to the book because it was receiving excellent reviews. And what I loved about it and what propelled me through every word in it is that Stacey Schiff demystifies all that and she gives you the real Cleopatra as much as we can know her. Now, I don't mean to embarrass you, but I'm just gonna do it. Uh-oh. <laughs> so, you are, you're a luminary now. Right, you are a famous person in this world. Oh, when it comes to me, you flatter me. No, no, no. But when it comes to certain fields, you are a really big person. And do you feel like you're misunderstood? Would you like to have a biographer? Like, if you had notes to your biographer, what do you think that you would like to say? Please don't. <laughs> Why? <laughs> well. I think people know enough about me, and then there are things you really don't, well, you may want to know, but you certainly don't need to know. <laughs> um, and, and I'm ba basically a very private person, and I, um, I'm, some people call me selfish. I've lived alone and haven't had a relationship for 36 years, and quite frankly, I'm very happy this way. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> thank you. And. It's interesting though, I was such a solitary kid and I loved being in my room, I loved reading, I loved playing with my Legos, I built things and deconstructed them and built them again. And it's interesting how we return to that in our adult life. There are certain things about us that we're just comfortable with. And, and my parents would always say, go out and play, where, where are all your friends? Um, and I was very content with just me. I feel that way too. I actually need a lot of quiet time by myself. Yeah, it's restorative. Yeah, which is really the, the hallmark of introverts, right? Yeah, we get energy from being quiet and by ourselves. There's a lot of noise in the world. We need an escape. And the noise is really confusing and also I feel really sad all the time by the constant din of tragedy. I mean, I yeah. don't know how we are all functioning, especially lately, this past week, it's all this been news. Difficult. It, it's too much. It's really too much. Um, the fourth book, as we kind of speed along with these things, is a change of your central identity, which is kind of related to your notes to your biographer. So we're going to talk about Thomas Wolfe, the North Carolinian who was born in 1900 to 1938. He died incredibly young. He had a kind of specific tuberculosis which kind of invaded half his brain. And the book that Tim chose is You Can't Go Home Again, which was published posthumously. And he had a different editor than Max Perkins, his really famous editor. It was edited by Edward Aswell. He's the youngest of eight children. He got his BA at University of North Carolina, and then he went to Harvard to get a master's. Interestingly, for the West Village, he was a professor of English at NYU for several years. Which I didn't know until you told me this evening. But that's why they asked me to come, because I'm a nerd. Like, <laughs> I would do this research. <laughs> his mom ran a boarding house and his dad was a sculptor. And he was, well, he made st stone sculptures, primarily gravestones, yes. which was profitable. He had an affair in New York with a woman 20 years his senior. Clearly he had good taste. And um, they, it was very violent and tumultuous, this affair. But they broke up after five years. The main character of Thomas Wolfe's You Can't Go Home Again is George Weber. So George Weber, the character, writes a really great book. It becomes very successful, but it's a kind of Romana Clay. He goes back home after his huge success, and everybody's really pissed. Yes. He wrote about his hometown. Right. So that's the inciting incident. I'm not going to give any spoilers. But the important thing is, what do you think about going back home after you become successful? Well, if you have written honestly and openly about your home, your upbringing, um, which I did in, in a book called Guns, Golden Rules, it can be very difficult. I shared with men, I'll, I'll sh share this with you. Um, my first book, I was very unhappy with. The, publisher and the editor were very, very, very controlling, 
and I wanted my voice to be heard, and I felt that it wasn't. Um, it was called A Guide to Quality, Taste, and Style. Don't read it, please. Um, but the second book, I wanted to be a kind of uh, modern manners for the digital age, and in a way I wanted to rant, which is never good unless it's in the privacy of your own home. Um, and I submitted the first draft, and my editor at Simon & Schuster said, where, where is your voice? And I, I, it had been beaten out of me in the first book. So I said, you mean you really want to hear it? And she said, yes. So I went crazy. I, you want to hear my voice? Here it is. Um, because that, as I said, it had been stripped out of the first book. So this is, Guns, Golden Rules is more of a memoir than anything else. And I write a lot about, where I, I tell a lot of anecdotes about my family. So. The legal team at Simon & Schuster read through everything and asked me whether I wanted to share it with my family before it went to print. And I said, asked why, and they said, well, your family may, may be a little uncomfortable with some of this. And I said, well, it's easier to ask forgiveness than it is permission. So if I go to them, there are they're going to be all these voices shouting at me. So it was published. My mother bought a copy, I didn't send it to her, and I received back this large manila envelope, it must be 18 by 24, and it's this thick, and it contains all of her annotations to the book. And she died nine years ago, I've, no, 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 she died seven years ago. She died a year after its publication. Um, I still haven't opened that envelope. But I said to Min, I also haven't thrown it away. So I feel very conflicted about it. But are you glad with the book? Oh, I'm delighted with it. It's, it's my favorite book that I've, that I've well, that's, that may not be true. I love the book, thank you. Yes, and, and, it's, and it's very truthful, and it's meant to be uplifting and inspiring and, and truth-telling. So this is really important because when you are a very private person, and most writers are incredibly private, you're always straddling this kind of line between how much do I tell and why. Oh, absolutely. I, right? I completely agree. So why were you able to talk about these things, and for what purpose do you think? Well, the purpose was to display some empathy for people who were going through similar things. Mm -hmm. um, it was to make me, I would hope, more relatable. And there are a ton of things I would never have told. I mean, one of the chapters in the book is about, um, it relates to, oh, I have to get this off my chest. Well, maybe you shouldn't. You know, maybe I, I, I'll tell my husband that I had this affair. Maybe you shouldn't, but I'll feel better. Well, he won't. So there's some things you should just keep to yourself, and I, and I, I subscribe to that. There's some things that are better left unsaid. And what do you think about the current mood in this country where you do share a lot more? I think it becomes a very muted voice because there's so much of it. Um, I, I, it's much more impactful when it's in, in a way an aberration as opposed to the norm. Um, I think there's far too much oversharing and, and I think we, we really are um, deaf and blind to a lot, of, to, to most of it, at least I am. What I find often is that I feel irresponsible, like I can't respond to all of it. Like I want to, I wish I could do more, but I can't because- We can't. Right. We can't. And some work isn't ours to do, and some work is ours to do, but I feel like there's a lot I can't do. It makes me feel really helpless. And I'll tell you, in, t in terms of my, of my own social media and, and social media for Project Runway, in all of these years, I've only twice intercepted a comment, and it was only in the case of Project Runway, never in my own social media, because quite frankly, I don't read the comments. Um, but in the case of Project Runway, it, it was to correct an untruth that was damaging to that 
particular designer. Was, no, 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 no. This is absolutely not the case. Would and you have defended yourself? No. But you had no problems defending somebody else? Correct. Isn't that interesting? Well, I don't feel I, I, I need to spend the time defending myself. And also, since I don't read comments about me, um, I don't know what they're saying. <laughs> so they're coming to get me right now. <laughs> Do you want to share with everybody? Oh, well, you know what? I want to save this best part now because the fifth book. This is very exciting. This is really exciting. Um, the fifth book is one of my favorite books in the entire planet, too. And it is by the great Simon Winchester, one of my favorite historians in the entire planet. And I was a history major. He was born in 1944. To the present, he's very vital and alive. He's British-American. He was educated at Oxford. Um, he's the, he received the Officer of the Order of the British Empire for services to journalism and literature. So it's actually Sir Winchester. And the book that Tim chose is The Professor and the Madman. And the surprise that we have is... So may I reveal? Simon Winchester is here. Simon, please stand. <laughs> please. Woo! And now that we've revealed your presence, I can say more than ever that I feel like the mongrel at the Westminster Kennel Club. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, very true. So. I know why I love the book. Would you please explain why you love the book? And I think you have a question for Simon. I do. Well, I love the book because I love the English language. I love words. Um, and what is the holy grail of all of it? The Oxford English Dictionary. And Simon's book uh, is about the development of the Oxford English Dictionary. Um, and it's a fascinating, fascinating, fascinating story about... Uh, this madman um, who's institutionalized, corresponding with a professor, and they don't know the other. And eventually, the professor goes to visit uh, the, his his um, uh, co-conspirator. I'll say, with a wink, um, in the development of this dictionary. And it's a remarkable, rem remarkable, remarkable story. Um, and. What I remember, well, what I will never, ever forget about the book, and it's very, it still makes me laugh, um, when, and, and this is all relative to where language has evolved to today, when the second edition of the OED was released, the English-speaking world went crazy. And here's why. The second edition contained contractions can't, won't, aren't, weren't, and every, everyone thought this is the end of the language as we know it. Civilization so, is over. Yeah, yeah, civilization is over. So when you think it, so my question for Simon is, given the, oh, what should I call it? I don't, don't want to sound too negative, but given where language is today, what are your thoughts about the OED and its relationship to, to all this. I mean, I know the o OED keeps adding new words that are, um, that it believes are relevant enough to uh, engrave, in a matter of speaking, but, but what is your feeling about this? I'll call it the erosion of the, of the English language and the printed word. I don't think it's eroding at all. I, I, yes, it goes through bad patches, if you like, but the word stock is being constantly added to, to the, I mean, they're, they're now creating the third edition, which will be published in hard copy. There will be 40 volumes produced in 2037. They say June 2037. And it will contain just a tiny bit less than one million words, one million head words, which is the current OED, the second edition, the one you kindly referred to, 1989, that was 680,000. The first was 450,000. So the language is 
I mean, it's not as big as Dutch, for instance. The Dutch National Dictionary was started in, I think, 1890 and still hasn't been finished. I think they're <laughs> up to the letter S or something. <laughs> uh, and, and this, but they have finished. I, the, the, there's another book I wrote about it called The Meaning of Everything, which they're bringing out a new edition um, this year, actually, because this is the 90th anniversary. This is the 90th birthday party for the OED. And during the 15 years since the first edition of The Meaning of Everything and the new one, they finished the Chaldean Dictionary, the Sumerian Dictionary, the Hittite Dictionary, which are all published in Chicago. Maybe you didn't know this, but no. Chicago is a big center of Hittite. No, we're in the Kennel Club. Hittite, <laughs> legend, uh, 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 indeed, right. Well, they're the sort of Jack Russells, if you like. But um, dictionaries, uh, I think it was the Hebrew di dictionary has just been finished in, in Israel. Very, very long-winded affair. Um, but the English dictionary just keeps plugging away. And I, I was interested in this idea that Frank, I think it was, was talking about having a competition for one's favorite word. May I just indulge myself for the, my favorite word from the OED is the word malmarocking. It's a very ugly sounding word, <laughs> but malmarocking is defined. It's just a wonderful indication of the complexity of the English language and that there's a word for almost everything. Although as my Japanese American wife will explain, Japanese is much more subtle in that regard. But let me fly the flag for England for a second. Malmarocking the carousing of drunken seamen on ice-bound Greenland whaling ships. <laughs> <laughs> but, but then, the, the, what marvelous thing happened in 1989, I think, Chambers' 20th Century Dictionary, which also includes the word, had a revised edition. And it ever so slightly changed the definition of malmarocking <laughs> to malmarocking the carousing of drunken seamen on ice-bound whaling ships, leaving out the word Greenland. And I was working for The Guardian at the time, and the leader writer, they wrote a sort of tongue-in-cheek leader on Saturday mornings, said, I've just seen the new definition of malmarocking in Chambers' second edition, and we're horrified to see that this foul practice is now unleashed from its native Greenland and appears to be spreading across the world. It must be stopped immediately. <laughs> it's important to have a good sense of outrage. <laughs> it is good, yes. It connects us to our feelings. <laughs> we would love to hear from the audience, and I'm going to beg you and plead you because I'm not so good at being insistent, but please let it be questions. Questions rather than comments. And Simon, and thank you. Oh, and by the way, I'm sorry, uh, Simon's new book. Yes. The History of Precision is now a New York Times bestseller. <laughs> and Simon has graciously signed all the copies of The Professor and the Madman, and I feel like Oprah right now. Yeah. It's not under your chair, but you're gonna get a copy before you leave. <laughs> and you will love it. You'll love it, it's really amazing. It's not a car. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a it's car. Better than. <laughs> So, Winnie is over here, and there's a question, yes. Hi, um, my name's Laura. I just had a question about when in the time of the day do you tend to read? Do you make time um, in your busy schedules, I'm sure, or do you just find that it happens naturally? Well, th thank you, Lauren. I, I, on a day-to-day -day basis, I read at night. Um, it's the only aspect of travel that I actually look forward to because travel's become so arduous these days. I, I, I read, I read in the airport at the gate, on the plane, on a train. Um, I love that time because I, I, it's, you, you can't do anything else, really. Um, and I read a lot and I return to books that I love a lot. Terrific, thank you. That was a good question. So, I'm Skylar from the Bronx. I'm a student uh, of Benjamin Mock. Oh. I made this shirt, and he says hi, and my question is... <laughs> Thank you, Skylar. Say, say hi back to Benjamin. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a question? Yes. Please. 
So, I can... Don't be shy, it's just us. We're a friendly room. How did you get over your feelings of suicide? How did I? Get over your feelings of suicide. <sighs> through an intervention and through a lot of wonderful people. I, I say all the time, life is a collaboration. It's not a solo. And, and we need to reach out to people who, whom we trust and, and have an affection for and ask for help. I didn't. Um, so that's why there was an intervention. And I ended up having the most wonderful mentor, doctor, friend who helped me through all of it and, and transformed me. And I'm very, very lucky and very grateful. I just have one real quick question. Uh, um, do you believe in God? Do I? Yeah. Do I believe in God? In, in God or Jesus? I believe in a higher power, certainly. Um, that was a yes. Yeah. A I higher mean, power. Yeah. 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 I mean, I w wouldn't call myself religious. I would call myself spiritual. I mean, in the in the throw of things, when I was about in my mid-teens, with with all, with all of this torture and torment that I was, was putting myself through, um, I didn't even contemplate a higher authority or anything spiritual. I, I felt barren. Um, but we go through bad patches. And we, as I said, collaborate to get through them and end up in better places. It's harder for some than others. You know, I think that lately, because there's been so much discussion about suicide and mental health, and I do think, I mean, and I am somebody who is a Presbyterian, and I do believe in religion for me, but I tend to think that when people are going through things, pointing to just a certain kind of religion, saying that's enough may not be fair. So I just want to say one of the things that I think that we've been talking a lot about, especially in the presence of children, is that... I think that's really fair to say that depression is a liar and certain feelings are liars. And I think many people in the suicide um, study world, thanatologists, who, pe people who study suicide talk consistently about how things get better, but it's very hard to see it at that moment. Absol and it is hard, if not impossible. Right, and that's the reason why yeah. it takes a lot of collaboration. Do we have another question? Something cheerful. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa? <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Grace. I, uh, Tim, I, I have a question about um, the recent change in the models on Project yes. Runway. Uh, I want to say, I, I read your op-ed, I think, in the... Washington Post. Yes, um, and I wanted to know how much of that change was your influence, what led to it, and to say thank you so much because it's so powerful to see um, women who look like you held up as a standard of beauty and... It's very powerful. Thank you, Grace. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Can I, can, I, can I just say in response to that, for those of you who don't know, season 16 of Project Runway, our last season, had models who ranged in size from 2 to 22, and our ratings were up 15%. <laughs> I've been wanting to do this for a long time, so thank you. Lisa. So my question. Yeah, my question is, how did you become a reader? And I know there were 14 books as a two-parter, which is the worst. Nobody ever asked two-part questions because it's the worst, but I will. Um, the second part is there were 14 books that you narrowed down to five, and I want to know what some of the other 14 were. Okay. Um, I, I grew up in a house filled with books. I was very lucky. My mother was a librarian. Um, my grandmother brought a new book for me every Sunday when she came to dinner, and I always look forward to that. What's the book? What's the book? And I was intent upon reading it before she came the following Sunday. So I grew up like this, and, and it was an escape for me. Um, I, we shouldn't even say an escape. It was an adventure. It was a journey. It was uh, a portal to places that were unfamiliar, and, and, I, and it's what still thrills me about reading. It just, it thrills me. Um, 
among the, well, among the 14 books, I, we don't have to go through all of them, but they range from James Agee's Let Us Now Praise Famous Men, um, which is, I get, sorry, I get emotional about these things. The beauty of the printed word, there is a single page near the beginning of the book. Um, it's a double page. And across it, sa it says, I can't do it without breaking down. But it's, it's, AG selects 10 words, and that's all you see on that page. And each word is like a stanza of music. And together, um, it, it is music. And, and on that topic, I also included his novella, A Death in the Family, um, the prelude to which is, or the preface to which, I'm using more musical terms, the preface to which is called Knoxville Summer of 1915, and Samuel Barber did set it to music as a, a, a piece for the soprano Eleanor Stieber. It was made most famous by Leontine Price. Um, and I included a biography of Carson McCullers written by Virginia Spencer Carr called The Lonely Hunter, which is an electrifying book. Um, uh, a biography of Nicholas and Alexander, the la Alexandra, the last of the Romanovs, by uh, Robert Massey. Um, a wonderful book by Michael Sims called Adam's Navel. It's a history and cultural, a natural and cultural history of the human form. Um, just to give you one brief aspect of it that, that I've never forgotten and never will, we are not engineered to stand upright. It's why we are plagued with back problems. Um, very interesting. A another author, Mary Beard, uh, wrote a book called SPQR, A History of Ancient Rome. Mary has written a number of books about the ancient world. And I included two books really from childhood, but I reread them about every five years. Lewis Carroll's Alice's, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass. Um, and then two books that just make me laugh out loud. Um, one by Roz Chast called Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant About Death? Um, and a, a collection of essays by Nora Ephron um, called I Remember Nothing and Other Reflections. So a, a diverse range. And they're such good books. They're really, really such good books. So one more question. Whitney is moving around. Hi, my name is Hee Jin Yim. Hi. Hi. Um, my question is, like you were saying that um, um, these open curriculums in the college um, where you choose your courses and make your own majors, um, I find myself, I went to one of those schools, and um, I majored in economics, but um, I just don't know what other uh, fields like history or culture or um, so how do you as an adult um, rather than just looking at the New York Times uh, bestseller list, how do you develop um, kind of your way of developing your own reading list that you're not just reading what you like to read but outside and I've heard um, if you find an author don't read just that one book and move on. Maybe read a couple of the books that is written by that author just to understand and connect. Um, so I was just wondering, like, you uh, writers if you, or readers, if you have a way to kind of um, develop a way to um, find other topics um, that are good and, um, and find other, what are some ways to find good, um, good books? Do you want to take a stab at this? Sure. I think that when I read, I've noticed that readers, as I read, writers will point me to other books that they read. So I read very promiscuously. <laughs> My life is really dull, but I read very promiscuously. <laughs> so I read all different fields. I love nonfiction. I, I write a lot of fiction, but actually I publish very little fiction, but I write a lot of fiction. But um, I read a lot of nonfiction, and I love biographies. I love history. Actually, there's a wonderful author here, Bill Goldstein, whose book, 
The World Broken Two is a terrific biography of the Bloomsbury Group, like things like that. But the reason why I read his book is because I adore Virginia Woolf and I, lo I love T.S. Eliot. I love um, D.H. Lawrence. So because I love those writers, I wanted to know more about their lives. And even today, it was very important for me to talk a little bit about the author plus the work, because I think they're related. Not always, but they're related. And I think that I think it's important to see the relationships between those things. So I like reading biography plus history, and I also like reading the, the fiction. Can I also add, <coughs> excuse me, um, one of the reasons I love libraries so much is the discovery method, the act of, of, of going up and down the aisles through the stacks and seeing what captures you. And, and each time I do this, it's going to be different things. And as, as Min is saying, what do those things lead to? Um, I, was, I was doing research with uh, a, a co-writer, Ada Calhoun, for uh, Fashion Bible, which was incredibly research intensive. And we had access to the stacks below Bryant Park at the ma main branch of the, or the, I should say the mothership of the, of the New York Public Library. And had we just been using Google, we would only have found what we were searching for. And being in the stacks, we found a wealth of, of incredibly powerful and, and relevant and, from my view, necessary content for the book that we would never have ever discovered. Um, so wander in Rome and, and just be curious about everything. Also, he just mentioned Ada Calhoun. She's got a terrific book out called Wedding Toasts yes. I'll Never Make. It's beautiful. And it's really beautiful, and she's a terrific modern love writer. And you've seen the essays. You probably have read them, and you have this entire collection. And it makes you really think about marriage in a very beautiful, personal way. So I recommend that. It's in hardcover right now. It, it, it's a book that really does make you laugh and cry. Yeah. I really was quite struck by it. I just wanted to say that um, I'm still thinking about the sound of music. <laughs> it's and a good I, thing to think about. I think so. And I even looked this up. So the song goes, perhaps we had a wicked childhood, perhaps we had a miserable youth, but somewhere in our wicked and miserable past, there must have been a moment of truth. For here we are, sitting, loving each other, whether or not we should. So somewhere in our youth or childhood, we must have done something good. Now, I don't know if we did, but it certainly has been a very good night, and thank you. Thank you all.